Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. This is the last day out of the 10 days that we've been teaching on miracles in Matthew. Today, we're going to talk about the power of unbelief, how to avoid that power of unbelief, and how to see your needs met. Let's go to the Word of God together as we talk about unbelief and, of course, the opposite, the strength of faith. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Thanks again for joining us here on the broadcast. And you are a student of the Word. That's exactly what we call the broadcast because this is directed toward you. you. Say, well, I don't feel like I'm a Bible school student. Well, we're always Bible school students. I treated my congregation like they were Bible school students. Told them from the very first Sunday I took the church, this is a Bible school. You're going to be learning. You're going to walk out of here smarter than when you came in. And you're going to learn the Word of God today. And so I treated the church that way because I see the teaching of the Word in church is making disciples out of all those who are converts. And if he can do it, as far as the body of Christ is concerned, we do it when we meet together in the church. So today I'm taking up the last of the series that I've been teaching for the past nine days. Today's the last day, the 10th day on miracles in Matthew. We've taken up chapter eight and chapter nine of the book of Matthew, dealing with the individual miracles that took place in Jesus' ministry, healing miracles. And last time we just took up and laid up the, the all of them. He healed old people, young people, blind people. The woman with the issue of blood that had it for 12 years, he raised the, from the dead a little girl. And we named all the different things, fevers, and all the way up to people being dead, I mean, minor things, and, and the, how he laid hands on people, how those that people touched him. He touched people, they were healed. They touched him, they were healed. But we talk about the common denominator among every one of them, and that was simple faith. You know, the disciples asked Jesus one time, they were talking about, you know, forgiving somebody. And they said, how often should we forgive somebody? And Jesus said, seven times in one day. If they come to you and they repent, you're supposed to give them up to seven times in one day. And Jesus wasn't just simply saying on the eighth time, forget it. No, he was talking about the fact that you ought to get this thing so far out there. In fact, 70 times seven in, in when they, uh, you know, when you're forgiving people. And honestly, sometimes you get that number that big. Some of those times had to be they committed the same sin again. I know with Abraham, he tried twice to give his wife away. And so we have others in the word of God that committed the same sin again, and yet God forgave them. And really what causes us to not sin is not just stomping our feet and, and you know determining and grinding our teeth. We're not gonna do that again. It's just growing up. That's exactly what it takes, growing up in the word of God. The more word you have in your life, the more you begin to apply. Then what happens is you find yourself having strength and one day you look back and say, I haven't committed that sin in so long. I finally conquered it. Well, there's other sins out there to conquer also. You'll never get to a place where you never sin again, but that should be your goal. The thing that we deal with here that we're talking about with these people is it's not just really a matter of more faith. It's a matter of unbelief, getting rid of the unbelief. The disciples that ask him, you know, what should I do? And he said, forgive them seven times in a day. They said, Lord, increase our faith. You know, the only time I really find those, those words in there about increasing your faith has to do with walking in love toward each other. Interesting, isn't it? It's told of the Thessalonians that when he came to their church, it said that what they did was that they began to grow in love toward each other. And he brings this out of growing in love toward each other. And it causes us our faith to increase. In the meantime, though, stop and think about this. Jesus made mention of a little mustard seed size of faith and basically said that'll move mountains. You know, the biggest thing that's been moved in your life was getting you into eternal life and moving that weight of sin away from you. And now you have eternal life where you used to be under the condemnation of death, born into death, but Jesus raised you up to eternal life. How much faith did that take? A mustard seed. If a mustard seed size of faith can actually cause you to move out of Satan's kingdom into God's kingdom, Satan's family into God's kingdom, out of death and into eternal life, out of a destiny toward hell, toward a destiny of going to heaven. If that mustard seed size of faith will do that, then why do we need more to be healed? It's kind of like we're looking for a mountain of faith to move a mustard seed. We really don't need to do that. It comes back to it. That little bit of faith got you saved. And that's the greatest 
miracle you will ever have in your life. So can it take care of cancer? All these things, instead of trying to get more and more and more faith, which is fine, because faith does come by hearing the, hearing by the word of God. Why don't you just unleash the mustard seed? But what Jesus talked about, it's not your need of more faith, it's the unbelief that you have. In other words, unbelief pulls in the one direction while your faith is pulling in another direction. And God never intended that faith be a tug of war. He intends for you to get rid of that unbelief where your faith can move anything, including a mountain. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about, the power of unbelief. Take a look at Matthew chapter 11. This is going to reflect back on the time when uh, Jairus's daughter was raised from the dead. In Matthew chapter 11, take a look at verse 20 through 24. Then he, that's Jesus, began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, notice this, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, you who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have repented until this day and remained until this day. He said, as bad as Sodom was, I know they would have repented. You have not. You're worse than Sodom. And so he said, but I say to you, it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Cities that Jesus cursed were Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, Sidon, and Capernaum. Jesus told the Jews that they were the worst cities of the Gentiles were better than the best cities of the Jews. Isn't that interesting? Because these cities that he cursed, all of them were Gentile cities, but basically came down to it, they were better than the best cities of the Jews. Why? Because he, the city he was in, Jerusalem, was going to literally take and crucify the one that came to die for them. The Messiah that had been prophesied all this time was about to go to the cross and the people of the city are gonna yell out, crucify him, crucify him. And probably this might not have happened in Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, Sidon, and Capernaum. They probably would have allowed the law to come in and the Jews literally wanted to override the law of Rome so they can have Jesus killed and Jesus crucified on the cross. So the miracle of Jairus' daughter took place in Capernaum. Isn't that interesting? And there's a spot of faith that is there. Matthew chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. We read this before. Let's talk about this, though, from the side of unbelief. When Jesus came into the ruler's house, this is Jairus' house, and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. Notice as they ridiculed him, this was, the, this was the natural tendency and this was the atmosphere in Capernaum. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. The family was there with them. They watched what Jesus did and the report of this went out into all the land. Jesus just simply told Jairus, have faith in God. And Jairus switched from unbelief to simple faith in God. And that's how quickly you can do it. Has unbelief captured your life? Has disbelief captured your life that when you think about the things of God and you think about getting healed or you bring in your need to the Lord is the first thing that interrupts is, well, I don't know. You know, I've seen others that not receive it. And all of a sudden, what comes creeping into your life is the attitude of the world, the attitude of unbelievers, or the attitude of carnal Christians, or the attitude of your natural mind, and you begin to reflect back. And of course, what Satan's gonna bring to your mind is all the cases that didn't work. And how do you know that you're one of those that it will work for? Well, the reason why it didn't work for them has to be somewhere back there, a simple lack of faith. I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus, and my faith is not in the fact that somebody got healed or somebody else got their need met. Mine's going to come back to one simple thing. If I trust in God, all things are possible. And my little bitty bit of faith, it might look like the size of a grain of mustard seed, is going to move this thing that I consider a mountain in front of me. But folks, stop and realize the mountain that the faith first moved was the fact that you were a sinner and not even saved by grace. And what could this have that could even match the size of that need that you needed Jesus Christ? 
So this miracle took place in Capernaum. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus simply says, get rid of the unbelief, get the people out of the room. And then from your own life, Jairus, get rid of the unbelief that is there. Talk to his disciples who were there also in the family. And that was a room filled with faith in a whole area of unbelief around them. And so literally it comes down to this is unbelief can stop faith and miracles in your own life. So here we have it in the home right here. It simply comes back to this. How do you get rid of unbelief? Well, we're going to talk about that. Jesus said it, and we'll explain it. He said, this type comes out only but by fasting and prayer. This type was not literally this type of demon that he was talking about the time when the man was demon-possessed. And Jesus said, no, this type comes out but by fasting and prayer. He was talking about the unbelief. The object of his of his sentence was, and the subject of his sentence was the unbelief. And he simply said to his disciples, this type of unbelief that's stopping you from being able to cast out a devil out of this child is your unbelief. It comes down to this, that unbelief has to be starved to death. It's by feeding on the things of the world we do throughout the day. It might be, you know, nothing that you think is really important or something. You listen to the news a lot. You listen to, you know, classic rock. You listen to, to country music or whatever it may be. And after a while, you come back to the simple thing of trusting in God. And you find that it doesn't work. We've been thinking on the things of the world. Again, there's nothing wrong with some things of the world. They're all right. But how much time does it occupy in your life? You should overwhelm it with time in the word of God, of study, of prayer, of having the word of God in the car instead of all these other things that are coming in the car. You should have the word of God coming into your life. And that way, when the slightest thing arises in your life, you are filled with the word of God. Why? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Unbelief comes by hearing the things of the world. And that's what God is wanting you to understand. You fed off too much off the things of the world. It doesn't affect your salvation, but boy, it doesn't affect your faith in God for the everyday things of life. There comes the smallest of prayers. You begin to doubt all that because why? You've been fed so much by the world and it begins to infiltrate a little at a time. You block it off until one day you can now learn how to handle it again and listen to a little bit of the radio, a little bit of the news, but again, know where to stop it. And uh, because Jesus understood some of the news, he even talked about it with his disciples. Talked about one day, I said, you heard about that tower that fell over and killed those people? That was just part of the news of the day. Jesus knew about it. So he kept up on what was going on in the world, but he really very much valued his time and spent his time in prayer and study of the word of God, getting close to the Father to keep his faith accurate. So yes, as just people, we need to be aware of what's going on in the world, but I can tell you this, as Christian people, we need to be more aware that no matter what's going on in the world, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. I've overcome your problems. When you wanna to come to me for faith to be healed, faith for your finances, faith for your daily life, faith for open doors to witness, he said, come to me. And you can come in a place of strong faith without unbelief present. So we'll talk about this when we come back from the break. What a blessing it is to be with you. We'll see you in just a moment. Miracles in Matthew is a systematic studying of the healing miracles of Jesus, which are presented to us in the book of Matthew. This series emphasizes the fact that Jesus healed believer and unbeliever, Jew and Gentile, male and female, old and young, rich and poor. He made no distinctions. Healing was and is for all. The sermon titles in this 10 message set are Jesus Healing Ministry, Jesus First Healing, The God of the Impossible, Healing of the Centurion Servant, Peter's Mother-in-Law, Think on These Things, After the Healing, You Are Forgiven, The Healing of the Two Women, and Avoiding Unbelief. To order Miracles in Matthew, visit our website at bobyendian.com. How much faith do I need to be healed? In The Grace of Healing, Bob Yandian answers this question and reveals the missing ingredient to the healing you've been praying for, grace. Throughout church history, the doctrines of grace and faith have been taken to separate extremes as they relate to healing. The result is that many believers struggle to receive healing from God. Those on the side of grace deny the need for faith, believing that God only heals a select few. For those who only see a need for faith, the pursuit of healing becomes a legalistic struggle to change God's mind. 
Pastor Bob takes a different approach with practical biblical teaching that balances both elements of grace and faith. You'll find the healing you've been waiting for when you find the missing ingredient of grace. To order The Grace of Healing, visit bobyendian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Unbelief will stop your faith and unbelief will then again stop miracles. If unbelief can counter your faith and cause it to be ineffective, then miracles cannot take place in your life. Healings can't take place in your life. Direction from God gets almost impossible to find. And we find that unbelief stopped faith and miracles in Jesus' hometown. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, Mark chapter six and verse six, Jesus commented in his own hometown how much unbelief there was. The disciples couldn't cast out the demon. We talked about this just before the break. That was in Matthew 17 and verse 20. Jesus upbraided his disciples for their unbelief in the ship. That was Mark chapter 16 and verse 14. And Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 warns us about unbelief and the power of unbelief. Let's talk about the blind man of Bethsaida. In Mark chapter 8, take a look with me there. And Jesus here has come to Bethsaida and Bethsaida is one of those places that he talked about back there. And he talks about Bethsaida and the amount of unbelief that is present. In Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 26, it says, He came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. This is the few in town with the trust in God. Bethsaida overall was a city of unbelief. Cities of unbelief really were dominated in those days by false religions false religions toward demons and sexual activity entering into the to the to the cities and all this and that was their form of worship and so they, they were cities that were very difficult to reach and Jesus even said some towns and the unbelief in it will be so bad that you're going to have to knock the dust off your feet and go someplace else and so when Jesus went to Samaria one day, which again, you know, the disciples didn't want to go, Jesus recognized that that area had now had a revival and the people were ready to receive Jesus in that town. And so when he went there, he led the woman at the well to the Lord and really commented to his disciples, it's going to be this way in town, go into town and get meat. And what he was referring to was not meat for sandwiches. No, he was referring to the fact that the people were prepared to hear the gospel. And Jesus, when they came back, he chewed them out for their unbelief and told them, these people were ready to receive you. All you had to do was give the gospel and they would have received. And so she ran back into town, the woman at the well, and brought back the men of the town and they all received Jesus as Lord and Savior, which led to the greater revival of chapter eight of Acts, where again, Peter and John went there and they went and led them in being filled with the Holy Spirit, but they, they went there. And so Philip, the evangelist, had led the whole city into being born again and they came and finished it up with being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have these great outpourings in these cities, but Bethsaida was one that was known for its unbelief. So again, he came to Bethsaida in Mark chapter eight and verse 22, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Key, he didn't do this before. He led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he restored and saw everything clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, do not go back into town nor tell anyone in the town. Apparently his, his house was separate from the town. He says, when you get back to the house, don't go into the city and don't tell anyone in the town. Well, Jesus had entered into Bethsaida. 
Jesus wanted this man to be healed on his own faith, and Jesus had to remove him first from the city because of their unbelief. This man's faith increased after Jesus laid his hands on him, and his healing partially came. The next mount that came on him, secondly, was because his faith had increased, but Jesus did something interesting on this man. He spit on the man. Spitting on anyone was a curse. Leviticus 15 and verse 18, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 14, Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 9, and they spit on Jesus when he was going to be killed in Matthew 27 and verse 30. Jesus did not spit on this man's eyes. You say, yes, it does. It says right there he spit on the man's eyes. No, Jesus spit on the blindness. You see, if spitting is a curse, Jesus wanted to curse the curse. And the curse on this man was blindness. So Jesus spit on him. Stories were told of Smith Wigglesworth. And Smith Wigglesworth at times, literally a woman came to him one time and she had cancer in her stomach and her stomach was out to her and he hit her in the stomach. People there just gasped when he did that. Knocked her on the floor. A man stood up at the back and said, you foul evil man. He turned around and said to the man, I know what I'm doing, be quiet. Well, what he said later was, I was not hitting that woman in the stomach. I was hitting her in the sickness and the disease. I hit the sickness in the name of Jesus. And when she got up, she was totally healed. Again, Jesus did not spit on this blind man's eyes. He spit on the blindness. Jesus spit on two others, Mark chapter 7 and verse 33, a man with a speech impediment. And Jesus also led that man out of town. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, he also spit on another blind man. The second time when Jesus laid hands on this man, his faith had grown. I mean, this man probably never expected a see point, so he put a little bit of faith in what Jesus had to say, and he saw partially. He said, I can see people as trees. He says, well, hang on, let's get the rest of this. And Jesus laid hands on him a second time. I've heard ministers say, well, you never lay hands on a person more than once. Jesus did. Jesus laid hands on this man more than once. Why? Because his faith had increased from the first time to the second time Jesus laid hands on him. If a person, I'm laying hands on them, and they say, oh, you know, I trusted in God. I say, let's lay hands on you again. And this time, simply increase your faith. If you trusted God, kind of, because you had little doubts in your mind, Jesus told the man, when the man said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus said, I will help your unbelief. He says, I, I do, and he laid hands on him and healed him. Even with a little bit of unbelief, Jesus sided in with the faith. And this, and this man had faith and unbelief probably at the same time. But what Jesus did was side with the little bit of faith he had. The man says, I partially see. Jesus said, fine, let's go all the way and laid on him a second time. I've had people come to me and, I'll, and they'll say, listen, I've been prayed for before. Would you pray for me again? And listen, I've heard people rail on them. No, we don't need a second time. I'll say yes, but this time I'll tell you what, I'll add my faith to the other prayer that was prayed over you. They'll say, okay, because it's scriptural. The two can agree on earth is touching anything. And so I agree with the prayer that's been prayed over them before. And you know, I'm just simply adding my faith to it. Jesus told him not to go to town or tell this miracle to anyone. Why is this important? The New American Standard puts it this way, don't even enter into the village. Doubleday uses it this way, don't tell it to anyone in the village. Jesus said this, go back to your house, don't go into the city, don't be seen in the city. And what I'm telling you is don't even go near of the village and don't enter into it right now. I'm not telling you in this particular case that Jesus was telling him never go back ever at all because he probably had to. What he was simply saying was, these people that are with you right here, they had faith to bring you here. You know, you could have been healed just on their faith because this has happened before. The man that was on the cot and let down through the ceiling and came down in there, Jesus healed him on their faith because he said when he saw their faith, not the man, because the man apparently didn't have much faith that was on the bed. Jesus healed the man on the faith of those that brought him there. So it's possible to do that. Here we have again, Jesus healed this man. This man had some faith, but this man had increased faith. And now this man is totally set free. And what Jesus said was, you see these people right here? They're going to be your friends. They're going to take you to church. And as you grow, there'll be a day when you can handle the unbelief that's in this city. Right now, you're spiritually immature. Oh yeah, you just got healed. But right now, you're a prime target for the devil to keep bringing back the unbelief to you. And you could end up being 
back, back in the same position right now. Now, was there other times when Jesus told people to go back and tell people that they had been healed? The answer is yes. I think of the man that was in the uh, tombs and he was demon possessed and had a legion of demons on the inside of him. And the man would scream out and the people of the city were afraid of him. And Jesus and his disciples went there where he was and Jesus cast a demons out of this man. And I mean, legion simply means this guy was filled with demons on the inside and it drove him to insanity and he would tear his clothes off and he would scream at everyone. And when he was set free, Jesus said, go back and tell all of your friends back there that what God has done for you. And so Jesus was in a town that was not filled with unbelief. In fact, it was filled with people that supported his ministry and invited him to come. And many came when he came. And so Jesus went out there in the tombs, went out there in the graveyard where this man lived all the time among the tombstones. And uh, they even tried to put chains on him. He would tear the chains. That's how powerful these demons were. Jesus cast them out and this man was totally back in his right mind. And Jesus said, now go back into town and tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. So there was no unbelief in this town. Oh, there was probably some, but as an overall thing, this was a city filled with faith. In fact, many who came and followed Jesus in his ministry, when he first came in his healing ministry, it told the cities they came from and they came from here and they came to participate in the healing ministry of Jesus. They came from the town where this man was that was in the chains and among the tombstones and Jesus went there to set him free. In that case, Jesus said, the town will support you. Go tell everybody what I have done for you. So in some cases, he said, tell people. Other cases, don't tell people. The difference wasn't in the person. The difference was in the town the atmosphere they live in. Perhaps you live in a city that is filled with unbelief. I tell you this, if God sets you free, go to church and tell everybody. Go to the church that believes in the same healing power of Jesus. Go to the church that preaches the same Jesus that saved you and now delivered you and hang around them because they'll do nothing but lift up your faith. They will undergird you. And this is what happened in these particular cases. There were times when Jesus said, don't tell anybody. But if you live in a town that, listen, the people of the city are pretty much born again and the, and the people love the Lord. They may totally agree in divine healing, but I can tell you this, that your, your testimony could be what will push them over the edge and they'll become a believer in the healing power of God. So that might be the town you live in and Jesus will tell you, go tell everybody. But it may be one of those where what you're gonna understand is I don't need to go tell everybody. I wanna find a good church. I wanna find a class in the church where I can become a part of it. I wanna find a home cell group where I can become part of that. And these people believe in the healing power of God that when I tell them, they won't come to me and go, ooh, you better be careful. This stuff could be of the devil. Know what you want is a group of people that will come and tell you, praise God, I've been healed myself. Others in this group have been healed. And we want to just simply tell you, we support you totally. And we're thankful for you. As you begin to grow in the word of God, you'll become stronger in faith, stronger in the things of God. And you can begin to go now go out and tell people where you work and all that. And their unbelief will not be stronger than your faith. Your faith will be stronger than their unbelief. Thank you. It's been a great 10 days and we've been teaching on, again, the miracles in Matthew. I trust that you've been blessed. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.